Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to our Sunday Gospel, Abecerra de Meneses. As you know, we're nonprofit organization 501c3. We function strictly on donations and big hearts through volunteers and donations. Our mission is to study spiritism and promote the, the practice of spiritual and material charity. As you know, we're on YouTube now, and um, it can be viewed on www.youtube.com Becerra Miami. The reading for today to set our tone is comes from the book, Our Daily Bread. It was written by our dear, beloved Francisco Candido Xavier by his spiritual guide, Emmanuel. Today's chapter is number 110, Personal Magnetism. Join me and let's see what they say. And the entire crowd tried to touch him because from him came a power that healed. And this comes from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 19. Nowadays, we're quite astonished to see a group of eminent spiritualists spreading concepts related to personal magnetism as if we were witnessing a novelty from the 19th century. This work of investigating and disseminating secret human powers compromises an invaluable aid in both present and future educational endeavors. It is important to remember that this spiritual endeavor is nothing new. During this passage on this planet, Jesus was the individualized sublimation of personal magnetism in its enchanting presence, and the crowds followed him, touched with singular admiration. Nearly everybody sought to touch his clothing. Radiations of love emanated from him, neutralizing recalcitrant illnesses. The master spontaneously produced a climate of peace that reached anyone who enjoyed his presence. Thus, if you seek an easier way for the full blossoming of your psychic potential, it is reasonable to take advantage of the experiences that earthly guides offer you. But do not forget the examples and living demonstrations of Jesus. If you intend to attract, it is imperative to know how to love. If you desire true influence on earth, sanctify yourself through the influence of heaven. And for reflections about today's reading, in today's reading, Emmanuel reminds us that although we did not know about personal magnetism, it has always existed in us as something innate. So it is not new to the human being. As such, we have the example of Jesus, who was the sublimation of individualized magnetism. Am I aware that I possess a magnetism that can be very useful for the good of our fellow men? As in the case of the magnetism, oh, I'm sorry, as in the case of the magnetic passes that we receive, am I offering this personal resource for the benefit of our neediest brothers? Okay, so with that in mind, Let's take a deep breath, <sighs> taking in all this wonderful energy that surrounds us, that was established long before we awoke by the spirits that watch over our center. Let us take a deep breath and join me as we pray, elevating our thoughts and our hearts to our Creator 
In the name of our beloved master and teacher, Jesus Christ, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this blessed opportunity in this lifetime to have found this wonderful doctrine. We thank you for this beautiful center, for all the love that is filled inside of these walls. We thank you for all our brothers and sisters who work so diligently with so much love and compassion for one another so that our center can remain afloat. We also thank you, Heavenly Father, for our guides and the guides of our center. We welcome the spirits that come to study with us and together we pray that we may grow closer and closer to you with your blessings and the blessings from the spirits that accompany us. We begin our gospel today and we pray that your will may be done in our lives today and always. So be it. Today's speaker is my sister, so she didn't want me to say anything else. So without further ado, here's my sister, Maggie. Is that good? Thank you. I love speech ready. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you, everybody that chose to be here this morning to listen to the gospel in English. And this is a short chapter compared to most that we've done in the past. It's relatively short, but it's extremely important. And we're going to start with an infomercial. The infomercial is that our website for Becerra de Meneses is www.spiritus.com. The website for the United States Spiritist Council is www.spiritist.us. With their permission and not infringing on any copyright charges, I have taken the liberty of using some of their slides. If you go to their website and you go into systematic study of spiritism and you click on there, they have all the classes in Adobe PDF, and they also have all the classes in PowerPoint. So anybody that's listening through YouTube or whatever that needs some type of resource for their center or their study groups, they're there and they're free of asking. There's no charge. We just need to give them recognition. So thank you for that. In the law, there's something called the statute of limitations. The statute of limitations, what it means is it's the last day that you have to file a lawsuit against somebody or to charge something, somebody in criminal cases if they committed some type of an act. And if you pass that deadline by one minute, one day, one hour, that's it. There's nothing you can do about it. It doesn't matter what. You can appeal to the Supreme Court. You can appeal to anybody. But once you pass that deadline, it's over. God has no statute of limitations. Mm -hmm. He loves us. He gives us eternity to correct our mistakes. He doesn't put us in jail. He doesn't sue us. He is the supreme intelligence and first cause of all things. And he's so loving and so just that he has given us some very, very wonderful tools to use. One of the tools that we have is our doctrine, our spiritist doctrine that teaches us that we can come back as many times as we need. Obviously, he wants us to do it in the best that we can, but we must follow his laws. There are 10 laws, 10 divine laws. If we break the laws, there's going to be an action and a reaction. There's going to be a cause and there's going to be an effect. And it's not because he's punishing us. It's because of our free will and how we used it to do what we needed to do or not to do. Uh, the spirits have also given us the doctrine. And in that doctrine, question 625 of the spirits books ask us, what is the perfect model? What is the perfect role model? Alan Kardec put it out there to the spirits and they answered, Look to Jesus. So that's another beautiful tool that has been given to us. 
and Jesus in that Sermon in the Mount many years ago, we have been reminded through Matthew that he told us, Blessed are the meek. Who are the meek and why should they be blessed? And what, what is all this thing that, that's going on? What is so good about it? Well, we are told at Matthew that the meek shall inherit the earth. At the time of Jesus, inheriting the earth meant a lot. It was important. And also, Matthew continues and he tells us, Blessed are the peace-loving, for they shall be called children of God. We all want to be God's children, right? We all want to benefit from that love and everything that he gives us. In this chapter, we're going to touch upon the importance of being meek, the importance of being peace loving and we're going to touch upon anger and what happens when we are angry what happens what do we attract and what can we do about it should we have the excuse that my parents were angry they had a bad temper so i have a bad temper uh, i'm taking a medication that puts me that way i drank too much coffee it's not about that so let's see a modern English dictionary, or thesaurus, makes it clear why meekness is associated with weakness. The definition says it's to be tame, timid, mild, bland, retiring, weak, docile, acquiescent, repressed, suppressed, spiritless, and broken. This is the definition from Oxford's dictionary. And some have even tried to compare it to humility, saying that it's the equivalent of meekness. But both the Hebrew and Greek's language have specific words for the word meekness. So it wasn't that there was a confusion, and there are not syn synonyms. Besides, humility does not fully reflect the meaning of meekness. We can be humble and not be meek, or be meek and not be humble, even though the association of humility and meekness is natural and yet another facet of meek, meekness. So we should not confuse the two, okay? There's a reason why it. Some of you might not be able to see what it says in red, and I apologize because some of the slides are very light. And it says gentleness. The servant of the Lord must be gentle unto all men. And this comes from Tim Timothy. Another word associated with meekness is gentleness, to be gentle. But like humility, it too does not embrace the full meaning of meekness. Both partially embrace the meaning of meekness, but they fall short. It's not the same. Humbleness and gentleness are not meekness. The characteristics and usage of meekness are much more involved than either of these two words. Now, Jesus. What does Jesus say? Jesus was not the first to state the importance of meekness. We see that theologians from the past, prophets and other people did use the word meekness, but he was the one that stated the importance of it. And he was the first one to collect in what we call it the Beatitudes that we just spoke about on the Sermon of the Mount where he organized a list of characteristics of the perfect human being. We recall that Moses brought us the Ten Commandments, and Jesus brought us the deep Beatitudes. And the doctrine brings us the clarification for the message that Jesus brought. At that time, we were not ready to receive that message. And even the doctrine, the gospel is the third book of the doctrine, but in the codification of the five books, we hear over and over, where the spirits tell us some things we're not ready to hear yet. We're not prepared, and our language cannot understand it. So we understand that everything takes its time. We are here today for a reason. We are here today for a purpose. Let's concentrate on today and make tomorrow a little better through our actions. There is a writer by the name of Emmett Fox, and he wrote about the sermon on the mountain. He's an author of an entire book about the Sermon on the Mountain. And he states that this beatitude, the one of meekness and peace loving, is among the half dozen most important verses in the Bible. 
He's not saying in the Beatitudes, he's saying in the Bible. So pay attention to how important those two little sentences are. We should recognize what Jesus said and when he presents to us meekness as a very highly deser desirable quality. He prefaced it by saying, blessed are the poor in spirit. Remember that that was another beatitude and also blessed are those who mourn. But he placed it within a context that contains qualities which are similar. Remember, they're similar to meekness, but they are not meekness. Whereas... Being poor in spirit and mourning, they are internal in operation. Meekness is not. Meekness is internal and external in its execution in one's life. In order for us to be meek, it's something that we're going to feel inside and outside. So that's why Jesus stressed the importance of it. Obviously, in this world where we live today, people think differently than Jesus did at the time. And they give a different definition and a different way of thinking to the way that we think today. They believe something else. Their interpretation of today's society is, blessed are the strong who can hold their own. I'll step all over you to get to the top. It doesn't matter what I have to do. If I'm getting my pocket full and I have my new car and I have my job, I don't care about meekness. I don't care about peace loving. That's more of the attitude that we have today. Those who are strong also fiercely, they believe that you have to be competitive, that you have to be aggressive, that you have to be assertive, and that the ones who receive recognition, admirate, they are the ones that receive the admiration and the reward. Is this what we're teaching our children? Is this the role model that we're setting for our future leaders of America? Are we as spiritists? conducting ourselves in meek and peace-loving ways. This chapter talks about those that speak beautifully, but inside there's a serpent. And you should look to the actions, look to the heart, look to the words that come out and concentrate on that. It's not what you say, it's what you do. Why does Jesus say that those that are meek will inherit the earth when he also says that one should renounce the things of the earth? Mm -hmm. One would think that it's contradictory, but it isn't. The answer is actually quite simple. It's on earth that we have the opportunity of growing spiritually speaking and advancing towards God. We know that when we're here, we are exposed to things where maybe that slight anger may come out. We could achieve the state more easily if we didn't have to struggle with adversity and contradictory emotions on a daily basis. What if we were all robots? Or what if we were all clones of each other? And we all dressed exactly alike, we ate exactly alike, we all spoke the same language, we wore the same clothes, and we were just little robots. Good morning, goodbye. Thank you, you're welcome. Sorry about that. Would we be able to grow spiritually if we were like that? Probably the computer geek tech here knows, but no, it's not like that. We are individual. We were created to progress and we must follow those divine laws. But if we decide to be a hermit, as has been stated in the past, and exclude ourselves from everyone, where is gonna be the test? of our patience, of our love, of our tolerance. And that's where our meekness comes in. We're also reminded that when the law of love and charity is finally the law of human humankind, all of humankind, not just the spiritists, not just the Christians, not just the Muslims, all of humankind on this beautiful planet Earth that God has given us, then there will be no more selfishness and the gentle and the peace-loving will no longer be exploited or crushed by the strong and the aggressive. It will not be something where we read on the, piece, on the newspaper, oh, somebody found something and they turned it in. No, it will be the norm. It will be what happens all the time when we're able to follow that law. Such will be the state of the earth when according to the law of progress and the promise of Jesus, 
It becomes a blessed world through the expulsion of evil individuals. This, of course, is in our chapter 9 that we're studying right now at item 5. So let's see. We spoke about tools. We spoke about all the tools that God gives us. What does he give us to counteract anger where we understand that anger is not a good thing? It's actually going to even affect you in your health. It obviously affects our parent spirit in our parent and our spirit, but it will. It's an organic thing that will affect our organism. So we're told, let's try to have patience when we are confronted by anger. Anger is only going to come out if your pride was hurt. Most of the time, when you try to find the root of why the anger came out, it was really usually due to our pride. So what the one of the tools that is given is patience. Patience is a virtue that enables us silently to submit, not because we're either placid or indifferent, but because we, we have learned to seek further consolations beyond the boundaries of the present that render the tribulations of this life secondary and futile. It talks about anger at home, and when you think that you are, I am the boss, and they're saying, and you are also, what? People don't love people that come and say, I am the boss, because secretly they're saying, and you are despised. Okay, maybe you think you're being respected because you are the boss, because it's my way or the highway. But in actuality, a little bit of meekness goes a long, long way. Let's think about this patience. We should at all costs be constantly on guard against anger. Patience. If you are patient in one moment of anger, you will escape a hundred days of sorrow. What if in that moment of anger we do something, we hurt someone, we offend someone, we say something that is going to take lifetimes for us to rectify? The words, I'm sorry, are not going to do it. So let's be silent. Let's be silent when that anger arouses within us. The meek person remains cool when others become heated. They know that God's justice prevails always. They seek to remain true to their calling and meet God's standards. And we see that there has to be an attitude adjustment. It doesn't just happen overnight. I am no longer going to be bad-tempered. I'm going to be the sweetest, kindest, nicest person in the whole wide world. And anger was in the past. And today I woke up and I'm perfectly sweet. No. Remember when we, when we, remember when we were young, way back, some of us, and we learned how to ride a bike? We didn't just get on the bike and ride. How many bruises and bumps and you know, do we have, and even if now we tried it after so many years, we'd be a little wobbly, right? So they're little steps, baby steps, one step at a time, but we can do it. We can do it. We have the ability to do it. The good returned for evil disarms the enemy. One's hatred is converted into surprise and surprise into admiration. Why? Because when somebody is angry at you, they don't expect that you're going to be kind or humble or meek. They expect a punch back, a scream, yelling a bad word or whatever. By awakening someone's somnolent conscience, this lesson may produce a deep impression upon the individual. Thus, we may through enlightenment save a soul from perversity. Don't we all want to save souls? So when should we be silent? When should we be still? When should we be calm? There's a very interesting entitled article entitled, Are You Sharp-Tongued? Some people say a tongue is a weapon and that we use it as a knife almost. That proposes the question, must the truth hurt? Let's put ourselves here and ask ourselves, do we say these things? Honesty is the best policy. I'm only being honest. When the doctor says, you have two days, you're going to die, he's being honest. Mm -hmm. So we have to tell somebody, you're boring. You're wrong about what you said. That was a lie. We did a course in our youth, a class in our youth group where we put Lucille Ball, and she had made a promise to Ricky Ricardo that she was going to tell the truth. And we soon realized it's not that easy. It's not that easy. The truth hurts. 
Wrong is wrong and it must be corrected. I've been through a lot, so it comes out when I express myself. It's just my sense of humor. Don't take it seriously. But we're jabbing, we're stabbing. Unfortunately, each of these excuses is probably painfully familiar. If they are, we must work on examining how we speak to others and what motivates us. What is our true intention? And it says, eat your words, okay? If necessary, eat your words. Be silent. Don't say anything. Perhaps it's not going to affect you as much as you truly believe that it is. Many times people come with negative information or whatever, and when we remain silent, they're waiting for us to say something, and when we don't, they're like, oh, well, da 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 da, -da and they walk away. But if we add to it, what's going to happen? There will be an explosion. So they tell us to be silent, to be silent, that tool, that beautiful tool. We need to learn when it seems necessary, okay? When silence is necessary. We need to learn to reprimand with kindness. What a difference. What a difference, right? We are going to need to reprimand our children or our whoever. But when you do it with kindness, it's going to be different. To discuss without heat, wait. If there's going to be an argument, my husband and I, why can't I wait till tomorrow and talk about it? It's going to have a whole different context, right? He wants to go play basketball. I want to come to church. It's okay. We'll compromise, okay? But we're not going to fight about it today. We'll use it tomorrow. Mm -hmm. To judge all things with benevolence and moderation. Benevolence is a beautiful, beautiful way to act. And our doctrine is filled with it. The gospel is filled with it. Our focus should always be on solving the problem. Why do we bring the problem? Why do we criticize, but we don't look for the solution? Okay? Uh, to look about the solving it, not just talking about it or condemning it, or gossiping about it. Gossip is not a good thing. Ladies and gents, because it used to be where women gossiped. But good morning, America. Men gossip too. And there is no good that comes from gossip. Use your silence to not gossip. Let's use our silence because I'm in it too. Jesus was blunt when it came to sin. But he was very patient and kind with sinners. So what should we do? We should get as few people involved in the matter. This is what's still talking about anger as possible. In fact, no one else needs to know about it unless it escalates. I can be upset at something that I can keep to myself. The email that I opened, the phone call that I got, the child that spilled the milk, whatever it is, it shouldn't be any cause for anger. Those are lame excuses. But we should concentrate on the matter at hand and that, not bring it up not bring up the past grievances. We're in the middle of our gospel at home and we remember the time in 1948. No, it's, what's done is done. What's done is done. Learn from it. Learn from our weaknesses. Learn from our mistakes and use it to our betterment. But don't keep bringing it over and over and over. Do not burn any bridges or threaten the others with ultimatum. Those bridges will have to be crossed, okay? And hopefully they're there. They weren't burned. We should not burn bridges in anything, in our personal, in our professional, in our spiritual life. When we're driving, are we going to have that road rage? What's going to end up from that? Remember that we are not trying to lose, but we are trying to gain a brother or sister. We are all children of the same God, independent of what religion we believe, what faith we have. He is our Father, and He loves us all the same. So let's keep on. Why should we be silent? A mind fed by godly wisdom will be better able to follow this advice and control the most wild of all members, the tongue. Remember, the tongue. As we grow in that great wisdom, our words become fresh and reliable. 
We lose the sharp edge from our tongues, the dagger. Aesop was an African slave and a storyteller who lived in ancient Greece between 620 and 560 BC. His fables are some of the most well-known in the world. I'm sure many of you are familiar with Aesop. One Zenos, a philosopher, asked Aesop, his slave, to bring him the best meat from the market. Aesop brought him a tongue. Yes, a tongue. When questioned by Zenos about his choice, Aesop replied, but I would like you to tell me what is better or sweeter than tongue, because certainly every doctrine and every art and philosophy is established or ordered by tongue. By tongues do men exalt themselves? You will find nothing more salutary than has been given by the immortals to mortals than the tongue. Here's Aesop, a picture of him. The next day, Zanus told the servant to bring him the worst piece of meat from the market. It's not McDonald's. Aesop brought a tongue again. What? Zena said, when I ask for the best piece of meat, you bring me a tongue. And then you bring the same thing for the worst piece of meat. Aesop replied, very true are the things you said. But I ask you, if you can find anything worse or more stinking than tongue, all me men perish by the tongue. By the tongue, men come into poverty. By the tongue, cities are destroyed. All evil comes from the tongue. Be careful what you say. You are right, Zena said. Let us be masters of our tongue. Maybe we should put that tongue away and practice that silence a little more. And so when we think about it and we think about Martin Luther King and we think about the teachings that are given here when we talk about anger, when we talk about reconciliation, when we talk about forgiveness, when we talk about the different things, we're reminded of Martin Luther King and a beautiful quote that he left us that says, in the end, we will remember not the words of our enemies, but the silence of our friends. Constructive criticism may be something that we feel a need to verbalize, but there are times where silence is going to be far, far more effective, far, far more superior. And then the spirits tell us through a book, after the death by Leon Denise that has now been translated again by the United States Spiritist Council. If you would like the book in English in a language that we can understand, you can check with the library, okay? But in this book, Leon Denise exposes us to the afterlife. And in considering meekness and peace loving, he tells us two things in chapter 25 which is entitled The Superior Life. We all want to have that superior life, right? And hopefully we will all one day have it. But he tells us, we have attempted to give an idea of what is the definitive celestial life according to the Spirit's teachings. It is the objective towards which all souls evolve. That should be our objective, obviously. The environment where all the dreams of happiness come true. Where noble aspirations are satisfied. Where the frustrated hopes, the repressed affections, and the impulses cut short by material life can flourish freely. There, the feelings of sympathy, tenderness, and pure attraction rejoin, unite and blend into a boundless love and pure attraction rejoin. Unite and blend into boundless love that inflames all the beings and makes them live in an everlasting communion amid the great harmony. And then he talks about 
some things that we need to go through and I'm not going to read them to you so you have to buy the book not really because we don't have all the time in the world but it's very cute what we need to go through and then he ends by saying which is very important so immortal spirits are there any immortal spirits here amongst us today thank you Lewis for acknowledging that you're here either incarnate or free if you want to climb swiftly the magnificent scale of the worlds and reach the ethereal regions which I believe we all do cast away everything that weighs down your steps and hinders your development anger is one of those give back to earth everything that comes from earth and aspire only to eternal treasures what are those eternal treasures work pray comfort support and love love to the point of pain accomplish your duty even to the price of sacrificing oneself thus you will sow the seed of your future bliss beautiful words by leon denise so as we finalize this chapter and as we finalize what it means to be, be meek what it means to be peace loving all these beautiful things we're reminded of the words in the gospel and of jesus that any listen please any form of aggression any form of aggression from the most minute to killing somebody that would be the maximum okay please repeat after me any form of aggression I want you to take that with you please I want us to take that with us any form of aggression violence Jesus and the gospel consider even discourteous expression do we ever have a discourteous expression with each other oh no oh not I we have discourteous expressions but we're gonna work on it with all those beautiful tools that our Creator and our doctrine in Jesus have given us through his example and why is it that it is contrary to the laws why why should we not do it isn't it contrary to the law of justice are we being just when we have those actions when we say those words when we have those negative thoughts when we gossip they're contrary to the laws they're not going to help us to progress spiritually and to have that inner transformation that we all so much want and need and that's what we're here for we're here for that Emmanuel reminds us of patience we discuss patience okay it's a tool it's a beautiful tool and he says that it gives us serenity for lives sufferings we're gonna have sufferings maybe some of us more than others we don't know what debts we have some of uh, our sufferings we're causing to ourselves today and we can't blame God or anybody for that except for ourselves so patience gives us serenity it gives us blessings and it also teaches us to practice to treat others the way that we want them to treat us so bear in mind that what will be our reward what is that afterlife that awaits us Leon Denise gave us a little a little taste right he gave us but Jesus promises justice to the meek and the peace loving and he tells us that in heaven we will all be children of God let us all strive to be children of God thank you and let us join now our Heavenly Father our dear Jesus who brings us and has brought us every 
possible example every beautiful example of love of forgiveness of tolerance of patience of humbleness our dear Dr. Becerra de Menezes our spiritual guides and our mentors our guardian angels we deep dig deep within ourselves and express our profound love and gratitude for all that you so lovingly give us and continue to forgive us and to open your arms help us to be meek and peace loving help us to love one another help us to love you above all things and to love our neighbor as ourselves remembering that our neighbor is everyone all the time God is good all the time all the time God is good we thank you for our doctrine we thank you for our free will and we ask you to help us to use it so that we can have this as a tool to be reminded of what is right and what is wrong knowing that so many spirits send us loving message through books and messages insinuations guiding us along that path along that good road named Jesus help us dear Lord help all those of us that are in need of your guidance of your love and permit us to gather in your name to use all these tools and to be able to flourish and evolve and progress bless those that are not here bless all those whose names are in all the books the vibrations box and all the lists and those that we have in our hearts and in our minds at this moment remembering very fondly our dear Julita Perez and anybody else that we may have in mind all these things dear Lord we ask in Jesus name Amen